Hey everyone, we're back. We've got another series of lectures for you. We're going to start our second section of zoology. This section has to do with genetics and evolution and natural selection. And we're going to start today by talking about meiosis. Now meiosis is important to this section. Uh, first off, we've been talking about cells um, and cellular division. We talked about mitosis. Um, now it's appropriate to talk about meiosis, which kind of completes the thought on cells, but you know, meiosis is very important in uh, heredity and inheritance. And so that's why it's appropriate for this section. And so we're going to be talking about uh, the inheritance of genes in this whole section. And this may or may not be um, review for you, but a gene is a, you know, the unit of heredity. It's a portion of a chromosome that codes for something. And those get passed on the chromosomes through the reproductive cells, which are called gametes. So eggs and sperm are called gametes. And so what this lecture is about is how do we produce eggs and sperm? Because they're obviously specialized cells that only have half the normal complement of DNA. And so to get that, we're going to use meiosis, not mitosis. Okay. And so again, a little bit of review. What do we call different forms of the same gene? Alleles, chromatids, dominant, or transcription. Well, different forms of the same gene are called alleles. So if we look here, here's a, a picture of a pair of chromosomes. And so a little portion of this chromosome is where you're going to find a gene. And so any portion of that chromosome that codes for RNA, that's going to be a gene. So remember, DNA makes RNA, makes protein. The whole thing does not make RNA. There's only discrete portions of the chromosome that make RNA, which then go to make protein. And those discrete portions of the chromosome, that's what a gene is. And so you, you're familiar with the term gene. You talk about your genes and genetics all the time. But it, you know, at this stage, we need to talk specifically about what exactly is a gene. So every chromosome has lots of genes on it. Now, later we'll talk about how actually the majority of the chromosome doesn't code for anything. And so the, the majority of a chromosome is non-genetic. However, the small part, you know, there are lots of genes on there. So the genes are very small relative to the size of the chromosome, but each chromosome has lots of different genes on it. Different forms of the same gene are called alleles. And so we need to, to make sure that we're using vocabulary properly. And so, for example, just a very sim simplified example, you might have a gene that determines the color of your eyes, and there are different forms of that gene. Um, some forms make blue eyes, some forms make brown eyes, some forms make green eyes. Combinations of those alleles can get due different combinations of colors. So they're all the same gene, but there are different forms of that gene. That's what an allele is. Okay, again, quick review. How many chromosomes do you see here? As always, we count centromeres, and there are two centromeres. There are two chromosomes here. How many chromatids do you see here? Well, each of those chromosomes has been replicated and is a pair of sister chromatids. So there are four chromatids in this picture. And so each one of these is a pair of sister chromatids, right? So this is after S phase. This is when the chromosomes have been replicated. At some point, we need to rip those sister chromatids apart like we did in mitosis, but we're, we have, we're not to that point yet. And so we've got two chromosomes in this picture, each of which is a pair of chromatids. And so when we talk about meiosis, we talk about um, the fact that the chromosomes can pair up into what are known as homologous pairs. And so every chromosome does not exist on its own. Every chromosome exists in a, as one of a pair, and that's called a homologous pair. And the reason that they act as a pair is because you got one from your mother and one from your father. And so those always pair up. Now, if you take a picture of all 
the homologous pairs and put them together, that's called a karyotype. And you've seen these pictures before. And so here's a human karyotype. And it's showing the 23 homologous pairs that we have. So we have 46 total chromosomes, but they're arranged as 23 pairs. And so homologous pairs pair up and match together because they're very similar. They have the same length, they have the same shape, but most importantly, they carry the same genes on them. And so the chromosome you got from your mom and the chromosome you got from your dad, they have the same genes in the same location and that's why they can pair up. Now they might, well, I actually have a question about this. Yes, here's the question. Do the homologous pairs carry the same alleles? No, yes, maybe, can't tell. Well, the answer is maybe, right? They carry the same genes that code for the same traits, but they might have different forms of those genes. Or they might have, you know, depending upon your parents' genetics, you might have the same alleles or different alleles. And so that's important to heredity. Okay, so again, you're uh, looking at a karyotype of humans here, and you're looking at a pair of, ho of homologa uh, homologous chromosomes. And again, these are duplicated chromosomes. So if you look at each one, each one at this point is a pair of sister chromatids. And so on those homologous pairs, each might have a gene for eye color, or a and also a gene for hair color, and also a gene for height. You know, it's more complicated than that, right? Like there are several genes that can control the color of your hair and several genes that control the color of your eyes. But we're just trying to make a, you know, a simplified example here. The point being is that each member of this pair has the same genes in the same location. And so that means that for each of those genes, you got one allele from your mother and one allele from your father. So you got an allele for eye color from mom and an allele for eye color from dad, an allele for hair color from mom and an allele from hair color from dad. Those alleles might be the same, they might be different depending upon your parents' characteristics. Where that, chrome, that gene is found on the chromosome, that's called its locus. Now, if you look to human karyotype, you've got the one pair that's not well matched. That in this example, they're different sizes. That's the sex chromosome. Okay, so the sex chromosomes are of, call, of course called X and Y, and a human female um, will have two X's. A biological female, biological male will have one X and one Y at the sex chromosomes. But this is not the only system in animals. Some animals have what's known as a WZ system. And so um, males have two W chromosomes and they're the, what is known as the homogametic sex. They have two of the same sex chromosome. Whereas if, you, if an animal is WZ, that would be a female. That's the heterogametic sex. And so like there are some fish species. So, so not every species uses XY. And sometimes if you've got two of the same sex chromosomes, that means you're a male. Whereas in humans, that means you're a female. But a lot of species don't use sex chromosomes at all. There's a whole bunch of different ways that organisms can determine their sex. And we'll talk about these because they're very interesting. Now there are other 22 pairs of chromosomes in humans are called the autosomes or the body chromosomes. And so um, any cell um, that has two sets of chromosomes is called diploid and it's signified by 2N. And so that's most of the cells in your body are diploid. And so they've got, you know, half of those chromosomes came from your mom and half of those chromosomes came from your dad. Uh, so for humans, the diploid number is 46. So we all have, in every one of our cells, uh, in any, every one of our autosomes, we have 46 chromosomes arranged in 23 pairs. So our diploid number is 46. That means our haploid number or half that is 23. And so here's a simplified example of an organism that um, whose diploid number is six. And so you can see that in this organism, in one cell of this organism, you've got six chromosomes and they're arranged in three pairs. <laughs> 
And so again, just a little digression. In this picture I just showed you, what phase of the cell cycle is represented by this figure? Metaphase, S, G2, or prophase. So here's the picture again. Well, your chromosomes are condensed, but they're not lined up at the equator, um, so it wouldn't be metaphase. Uh, S and G2 are both an interphase, and you can't see the chromosomes, so it's got to be prophase. Okay. So now, when we talk about the gametes, a sperm or an egg, those have to be haploid. They have to have half the typical chromosome content because later on they're going to fuse together and bring you back to the typical chromosome content. And so if you didn't make the gametes haploid, if they were also diploid, then every time they fused you would double the chromosomes. And after a couple generations you'd have so many uh, uh, chromosomes, this, this cell wouldn't have room for anything else. As mentioned for us, the haploid number is 23. And so how do we go from diploid to haploid? That's what meiosis does. And so we just need to go through the steps. They're very similar to mitosis. And so meiosis is preceded by an interphase, <coughs> excuse me, interphase that has a G1 and S and a G2 phase. So we still have to copy all the chromosomes during the S phase. But whereas mitosis, you ended up with, you know, I and T, identical twins. You ended up with two cells that were identical. Meiosis gives you E and S, eggs and sperm, but you're going to end up with four cells and they're each going to be unique. So that's a big difference here. And since we need to have the chromosome number, we have to go through the cycle twice. And so that's kind of, you know, just an interesting solution to this problem. We already have this thing called mitosis that we use whenever we're copying cells and dividing in two. And so we just run through those stages twice. That allows us to cut the number of chromosomes in half. And so we talk about meiosis one and meiosis two. And so the stages of meiosis are kind of like mitosis. They've got the same names, they come in the same order, there's a lot of the same stuff going on, but you know, what do I mean kind of? There's just a little bit of difference, because there has to be a little bit of difference because it's a different procedure. The big difference is in meiosis one, we're splitting up those homologous pairs. And we're not splitting sister chromatids. We don't split sister chromatids until meiosis two. Now you'll recall, if you think back to mitosis, that the point of mitosis was to rip those sister chromatids apart, and that's what we did. But we're not gonna do that until meiosis two. In meiosis one, all we're doing is separating those homologous pairs. And so this is showing you that, um, you know, the interphase, you've got the same thing. You've got, you know, the first gap phase, then you've got the S phase when the chromosomes are duplicated, then you've got the second gap phase. And so then we go into meiosis one. In meiosis one, we're separating those homologous pairs. So in this example, you only have one homologous pair and it gets split and they each get partitioned into a different cell. Then each of those cells goes through the whole procedure again. And that's called meiosis two. And this time we're going to rip apart those sister chromatids. And so it would that's what we did in mitosis. Now we're doing it in the second stage of meiosis. We rip those sister chromatids apart, and so then we end up with four cells. And each of those cells is going to be unique. So the stages, like I said, they're named the same, they come in the same order. Just like before, if you want to remember them, IP more after this coke. Interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then cytokinesis. Since we're talking about meiosis one, though, we label them prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one, just to keep them separate from meiosis two, obviously.
Okay, again, just a quick review. What does not happen? Which of the following does not happen in prophase? The nuclear membrane dissolves, the chromosomes condense, the mitotic spindle forms, or the chromosomes replicate? Well, the chromosomes replicate during S phase, right? The rest of this stuff all happens during prophase, and it's the same in meiosis. And so in prophase one, just like before, the nuclear membrane dissolves, you know, we're going to be moving chromosomes around, and so we can't have them constricted in the, the, the nucleus anymore. So that nuclear membrane is going to dissolve so the chromosomes can move around. The chromosomes need to condense. If they're gonna move around, they can't be these long strings wrapped all around the cell. They have to condense. The mitotic spindle's gotta form. How do we actually move the chromosomes? What gets them to move where they need to go? That mitotic spindle, those microtubules, grab the chromosomes and move them around. So what's different in prophase one of meiosis compared to prophase of mitosis? The big difference is in meiosis one, the homologous pairs pair up. That doesn't happen in mitosis. And so here we're looking at prophase one, and you can see in this example, you've got, uh, looks like three homologous pairs, and they all find each other. They all go find their meiosis buddy. And so they're gonna start by finding their meiosis buddy. That does not happen in mitosis. Now, because these homologous pairs find each other in prophase one, you get some interesting phenomena. And because these homologous pairs are homologous pairs, they have the same genes, they can line up gene by gene by gene. And so they can stand next to each other and their genes are all lined up. Consequently, you can get something called crossing over. And crossing over is an interesting phenomenon. It's where you can swap little pieces of a chromosome among the homologous pairs. And so here we've got an example where you've got one homologous pair. The chromosomes have been replicated, so each chromosome is two sister chromatids. But since they're homologous pairs, the genes are all in the same loci, and so it's easy for them to line up gene by gene. They sort of match because that's what homologous pairs do. Consequently, it's easy to swap a piece of one homologous pair with the other homologous pair. Because they're lined up gene by gene, those genes are right next to each other, they have very similar code, and so one arm can break and this arm can break and they can exchange with each other. And then they can break in a different spot and swap back, and little pieces of those chromatids can swap between homologous pairs. That's crossing over. And so the end result is you get some chromatids that are a mismatch or a, a, a mashup of alleles from both parents. And so this is a, a way to increase genetic variability. And so if you look, look at, at the, the blue chromosomes, that's the pair that was inherited from the father. And so you see before crossing over, there's two chromatids that are identical. And then the red ones came from mom and they're also two chromatids. When you have crossing over, it's between those chromatids on the inner part. And so the first chromatid is all blue and all those alleles all came from dad. And that's identical to a chromosome. Well, that's, that, that, those all came from your dad. The far right one is all red. That chromatid, all those alleles, all came from the mother. But the two inner chromatids, you see they're a mix of blue and red because there's been crossing over. And so there's a mix of alleles between mom and dad. And so this is a way to get genetic variability. Now it only happens because those homologous pairs meet up in prophase one. If they don't come near each other, then they, they can't swap DNA, but because they come together, they can swap DNA. Okay, so after prophase comes metaphase. So in metaphase one, it's just like in mitosis. The chromosomes go to the middle. Chromosomes go to the middle in metaphase, but they do it in a little bit different manner. So again, this is a difference between meiosis and mitosis. During metaphase one, the homologous 
pairs line up at the equator. And so here you can see in this example of metaphase one, those homologous pairs are still together and they're lined up with their meiosis buddy right at the equator. Now contrast that with metaphase of mitosis. In metaphase of mitosis, the chromosomes are not paired up. You get one single line of chromosomes at the equator. You see how that's different? Whereas in metaphase one of meiosis, you get a double line of chromosomes because they're paired up. Now, another thing we need to point out here that's important is that when those homologous chromosomes line up during metaphase, um, during metaphase one, they orient randomly. So what am, I, what am I trying to say there? Look at this picture. You see that the first pair, you've got the red chromosome on top, the, sec the blue one on the bottom. The middle pair, you've got the red chromosome on top, the blue one on the bottom. The third pair, you've got the blue chromosome on top, the red one on the bottom. Now there's, you know, again, there's some crossing over, there's a little bit of mismatch on some of these, but you get my point, is that you don't get all the red ones to one side. You don't get all your mother's chromosomes to one side of the cell and all your father's chromosomes to the other side of the cell. It doesn't work like that. It's a flip of a coin. Just however they approach the plate, they randomly orient along that equator. And that's called independent assortment. Well, that's also important for genetics because that means that you get random combinations of your mother's and your father's alleles. And that, again, is important for genetic variability. Okay, next phase is anaphase one. And this is where chromosomes get separated. But we're not ripping apart chromosomes in anaphase one. We are just separating homologous pairs. And so we're just taking those homologous pairs and just sending them to either side of the cell. And so if you notice in this picture, here again, this is anaphase one, the sister chromatids are still attached to each other. We are just separating those homologous pairs. Again, you see that characteristic kind of V shape, right? The, the microtubule is grabbing this, hum, this you know, chromosome right at the middle and pulling it. And so it's getting pulled by the belt buckle. And so its arms and legs are kind of flailing behind. And so that's a character, you know, characteristic way to tell when you're looking at um, anaphases, when you can see those, those V shapes. But it's not sister chromatids that are being separated from each other. It's those homologous pairs. Contrast that with anaphase of mitosis. In anaphase of mitosis, you're ripping sister chromatids apart. So that's another difference between these two. Okay, and so then next you've got telophase one and cytokinesis. These happen really quick. Um, they often are simultaneous. And now if you remember in mitosis, at this point, like you had the nuclear membrane starting to reform, uh, you started to have the chromosomes started to stretch out, the mitotic spindle started to disappear, all that stuff happened in mitosis. That doesn't happen in telophase one because we still have to go through the whole cycle again. So we don't do any of that. Telophase one and cytokinesis is basically just, let's wrap up meiosis one and split these two things in half. That's, and it happens very quickly. But those sister chromatids are still attached to each other, so we gotta go through it again to rip those apart. Okay, so now after cytokinesis one, you've got two cells. How much DNA is in each cell? What's the relative amount of DNA? Do you have the haploid number of chromosomes but twice the DNA? Do you have the diploid number of chromosomes and twice the DNA? Do you have the haploid number of chromosomes and one times the regular amount of DNA? Or do you have diplo diploid number of chromosomes and one times the DNA? Think about this. Well, the answer is A. After cytokinesis one, you've got the haploid number of chromosomes, but, eat, but the cell still has twice as much DNA as it needs. So you've separated homologous pairs. You've gone from diploid to haploid, but each one of those chromosomes is still a replicated chromosome. 
and still has got twice as much DNA as it needs. So you've got half the number of chromosomes in each cell, but still twice as much DNA as you're supposed to have. So this is just sort of repeating that here. You can see that the, the homologous chromosomes have been split apart, so now each cell has only half the number of chromosomes of a typical cell, it's haploid. But each one of those chromosomes has been replicated, so you've still got twice as much DNA as you need for an egg or a sperm. So we need to go through meiosis two in order to reduce that DNA. And it's the same phase as before, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, followed by cytokinesis. And this time it's going to be very similar to mitosis. The steps are going to look nearly identical. You just have half as many chromosomes. And so if you look, um, we've got two lines here because you ended up you know, with two cells after meiosis one. But you can see um, prophase, the chromosomes uh, are condensing, the mitotic spindles forming. Um, a lot of that has already happened, so you kind of slide through prophase pretty quick. But metaphase two is where the chromosomes line up at the middle, and now you see it's like mitosis, a single line of chromosomes. We don't have homologous pairs anymore. Anaphase is when we rip apart those, those sister chromatids. And then telophase two and cytokinesis occur. And so that's when the chromosomes start to stretch out, the nuclear membrane starts to reform, the mitotic spindle starts to dissolve, and you end up with four cells, each of which has the haploid number of chromosomes and each of which is unique. And so here's the figure from your book. Uh, telophase one, cytokinesis one are so quick, your book just kind of ignores them. Some people just ignore them. You know, you, some books just say you slide straight from anaphase one straight into prophase two. It's fine, either way. Okay, how are these two processes the same? They both start with interphase. Their interphase is split into G1, S, and G2. They both replicate all the chromosomes during S phase. All right, so how are they different? Mitosis takes place in the somatic cells or the body cells. Meiosis takes place uh, to form gametes, takes place in the gonads. Mitosis, you end up with two cells and they're identical. Meiosis, you end up with four cells and they're haploid and they're all different. You get cytokinesis or cell division just once in mitosis, you get it twice in meiosis. In mitosis, the homologous chromosomes don't pair up, whereas in meiosis they do pair up uh, but then they're separated during anaphase one. Now I mentioned before um, some of these steps, some of these things like crossing over and independent assortment that lead to generic genetic variability. Well, sexual reproduction, which is you know the end result of meiosis, creates a lot of variation. And when we talk about evolution and natural selection, we'll talk about how that variation is important. But how do we get variation? Or what, well, first off, what do I mean by variation? Meaning that the offspring have a lot of variability. And so the offspring will have the traits of their parents, but they'll have unique combinations of those traits. And so how do we get those unique combinations of traits? How do we get this variability? Well, we mentioned crossing over. And so crossing over gives you new combinations of alleles. Uh, we mentioned independent assortment. And so that gives you unique combinations um, of chromosomes. And another way we can get variation is random fertilization. And so any sperm can theoretically uh, fertilize any egg. And so you can get these random combinations of sperm and egg. And so again, crossing over, um, you get unique combinations of alleles. So some of these chromatids have a mix of alleles from the mother and the father. Independent assortment, the mother's and father's uh, chromosomes line up at the equator during metaphase in a random fashion. And so what they're trying to show you here 
is the two possible ways. So here's a simplified example of an organism, excuse me, whose diploid number is four. So it's got two pairs of chromosomes. Of course, in each pair, one came from the father, and those are blue. One came from the mother, and those are red. And so if you look, one possible way for them to line up during metaphase one is, you know, for all the blue chromosomes are on the left and all the red chromosomes are on the right. But it's just as likely that for one pair, the blue is on the left and the red is on the right. And for the other pair, the blue is on the right and the red is on the left. It's a flip of a coin and that occurs at random. And so then during metaphase two, so that, that's during metaphase one. And so then that cell is going to split in half. And so then during metaphase two, you've got a different combinations that line up and eventually you end up with different daughter cells. So possibility one gives you those four unique haploid cells that you see on the left. Possibility two gives you a different set of haploid uh, gametes that you see on the right. And so you have a the, the possibilities, you have a lot more possibilities of different alleles just depending upon how those chromosomes line up during metaphase one. And that's why I just said there, how the chromosomes line up during metaphase one determines the combinations of alleles in the gametes. And so uh, if you look on the left, um, each of the gametes uh, is going to have either all alleles from the father or all alleles from the mother. Whereas if the chromosomes line, line up like they do in possibility two on the right, you see that all those gametes have a mix of alleles from the, the uh, you know, a mix of chromosomes from the father and from the mother. Um, and so that's a way to get new combinations of alleles. Well, um, this is only a very simplified example of an organism who, whose diploid number is four. Our diploid number is 46. And so just based upon independent assortment, there are over eight million ways your chromosomes could be arranged. And so that's a tremendous amount of genetic variability that's possible. And then finally, any sperm, any one of those gametes can fuse with any other egg. And that occurs at random. And so you've got two gametes, each of which has over 8 million possible chromosome combinations, means that you can produce a zygote with any of about 70 trillion diploid combinations. And so that's why we can safely say that every individual is unique because all these chromosomes and alleles come together at random. And so you have you know 70 trillion some combinations, but this doesn't even include crossing over and crossing over is going to increase the number of uh, combinations you can get. And so, you know, now those alleles came from your parents. So again, you've got the same traits as your parents, but in different combinations. So that makes everybody, um, you know, look a little bit like their parents, but also everybody looks very unique. And so what's the importance of all this? Well, again, sexual reproduction, retains the traits but gives you new combinations of those traits and that's important in evolution because the environment's always changing and so if you can produce offspring with lots of variability you have a much better chance of at least some of your offspring surviving in a new unpredictable environment and so um, you see that uh, this is a big reason why we think you know, uh, sexual reproduction has evolved is because it increases the variability in the offspring. And so understanding how these gametes are created through meiosis helps understand how the parents' traits get combined to make new offspring. And that ultimately results in what we call Mendelian genetics. And you're probably familiar with Mendelian genetics or Punnett squares. And so Mendel, you probably heard this story. He was a monk 
and um, he studied uh, plants and lots of things, but he did carefully controlled experiments where he bred different types of peas and then recorded the offspring and he figured out some of the basic laws of inheritance. Well, now we know those basic laws of inheritance are based upon the arrangement of chromosomes during meiosis. So that's why it's important to understand meiosis. Now Mendel was living and working about the same time as Darwin in the middle 1800s, um, early 1800s, middle 1800s, but they never heard of each other. And so, you know, Darwin recognized that he didn't have any idea how traits get passed and from parent to offspring and how any of that worked. Um, and he recognized that that was an important step in his idea of evolution by natural selection. Mendel had never heard of anything about evolution, but he, um, he figured out some of the basic laws of inheritance. And it was only until later, 50 years later, when people put these two together and realized, oh wow, these things really all make a lot of sense when you combine them. And so if you've ever done any kind of livestock breeding or breeding of animals, you're working with Mendelian genetics. Mendel's laws are useful for predicting the offspring from a given cross, right? So if you, if you cross certain kinds of chickens, you can predict what the offspring are gonna look like. And then if you cross the offspring, you can predict what the next generation, the F2 generation is gonna look like. And so then you can start to explain things like, um, okay, here we have two black dogs, and sometimes we can breed two black dogs together and we can get black dogs and brown dogs and yellow dogs. And how do you explain that? And how do you predict that? Well, Mendel's laws were uh, help you figure some of that out. But Mendel's laws are based in the arrangement of chromosomes during meiosis. And so you can breed stuff together and usually predict what the offspring will look like. That's what Mendel figured out. But why do his laws work? You know, he didn't know anything about chromosomes. He didn't know anything about cells. Um, but he figured out the laws. Later, we figured out all oh, those laws work because of how chromosomes move during meiosis. And so going back to this idea of independent assortment, you know, how those chromosomes uh, line up at random during meiosis determines the mix of parental traits which allows us uh, which then determines the offspring and so um, you know this is how we can uh, predict what offspring are going to be based upon what traits the parents have and so you've probably done a Punnett square before where you take parents and you know their traits and then you figure out the different combinations of those traits and so then from that you can predict um, what the offspring should look like and so that's all based on Mendelian genetics which is all rooted in the movement of chromosomes during meiosis. Now I kind of talk about Mendelian genetics versus molecular genetics and so Mendelian genetics is what I just talked about it's predicting these offspring whereas what I consider molecular genetics is specifically understanding the DNA and how the DNA functions in the cell to end up making a particular trait. And of course, these days, we're unlocking the molecular secrets of DNA and we're learning a tremendous amount of biology. Excuse me, so in this class, we're gonna spend a lot more time talking about molecular genetics uh, because it is, uh, you know, what we're, it's, it's growing so fast and it is essential to, to really understanding um, biology. And you've probably had a lot of experience with Mendelian genetics, but they're both very important. Mendelian genetics is important and it works at sort of the chromosome level, as I've said. Um, but it starts to get complicated when you have multiple loci. And so most traits are not controlled by a single gene. Most traits are controlled by combinations of genes. And also it gets complicated when you have multiple alleles. And so, you know, you don't have just a, uh, 
blue allele and a brown allele, but maybe a green allele or, or whatever it is. And so once you start getting lots of alleles, which is pretty typical, and lots of loci, which is pretty typical, it starts to get hard. Your, your Punnett squares get huge, and it gets a lot harder to predict things. And so, for example, you know, how can we get all these different coat colors from two parents who both have the same coat color? Well, it's because you've got multiple genes working on coat color. You've got a gene that controls what color of pigment is produced, but then you have another gene which controls whether or not that pigment gets stuck, gets laid down in the, in the hair follicles. And so you can have puppies that can produce black pigment or can produce brown pigment, but they don't lay that pigment down, and so they end up being yellow. And so the point here is, is that um, once you get multiple loci working together, then you can get lots of different combinations, but it gets more complicated to figure out. Ultimately, though, it all depends upon the molecular level. It all depends upon understanding what the DNA is doing. And so that's what we're going to focus on mostly. Molecular genetics gives you a much deeper understanding of exactly what's going on. You can't say one or the other is more important, but um, I think you can get a better feel, you can better understand why a particular trait exists once you understand how the DNA is forming that trait. And so what color of offspring do I expect from the parents? Mendel, Mendelian genetics helps you figure that out. But exactly how do those different alleles make different coat colors? How does this allele make a brown pigment and this allele make a black pigment? Molecular genetics will tell you that. And so we're going to spend um, a lot of time talking about molecular genetics and, and um, the synthesis of proteins. And, and this is um, uh, really interesting stuff and it's really good for understanding biology. But at any rate, um, we'll get to that in future lectures. Uh, this has been meiosis, uh, the creation of gametes. So let me know if you've got any questions, and I'll talk to you later. See ya.